Hi, I'm Crystal, and this is Hope, although she would prefer to be called Hunter. She's um, going through a gender... <laughs> a gender um, identity crisis, so... Um, she would rather be he, so Hunter it is. Anyways, um, this is uh, what we're doing. My teacher, well, technically her teacher, um, has repeatedly implied that I'm doing her work for her. Now, she's really illiterate, and that is partly genetics, I believe, because her father is illiterate. Several of her uncles are illiterate, so it seems to be a trend in the family. Um, and I've been working with, with her real hard on it, but um, still the teachers tend to disregard what I'm telling them and pretend that, you know, I'm doing her work for her. So I'm going to start making a series of videos of me going through the lessons with her and showing that I'm not actually doing the work for her. Because I personally want her to learn. I, I struggle myself. I have my own insecurities about um, her not being able to read. Because, you know, when, she, when I teach her the lessons, she picks up on everything super fast. But for some reason, reading is a super big struggle for her. And it frustrates me because, you know, um, based on everything else, I seem to be a very good, um, what they call a learning coach or, you know, something of the variant. And, and she picks up everything else so quickly that it makes me feel like I'm a good coach. But then when she can't read, it gives me a few insecurities. And she has her own insecurities with reading because she's struggled since kindergarten with this. Anyways, one um, our first lesson right now we have going on is um, a unit test. Um, we've been doing this um, online schooling for a couple years with her. Um, this year she changed to a different school. She was um, with a K-12 school before and now she's with Connections Academy. And her teachers constantly um, insinuating that, that I'm doing her work for her, constantly asking Hope questions, and then when Hope says, oh, I don't remember, because that's what kids do, I swear. Um, my oldest kid does that, too. Um, it, she she makes it sound like I'm actually the one doing her work for her. I'm forgetful. <laughs> Anyways, um... So it's not like an online, uh, it's not like a homeschool school. It's an online school. The, the online school provides us everything we need. And, you know, um, I don't have to actually create a curriculum or anything like that. I don't know who's going to be watching this because I got to put it on YouTube in order to give it to the school. So um, if anybody happens to come across it, that's what I'm doing. That's why I'm saying all of this. Anyways, <laughs> um, we're going to start. It's um, Lesson 26, Adventures Unit Test for Language Arts 5B Unit 2 Adventures. Okay, so uh, what I normally do is I normally read to her most of the material. Um, every now and then, if I see this is a little bit too much for her to read right here, right now, at her level. Um there are times, though, that I will actually, if there's like a smaller amount, lesser words, I will get her to try to read them herself um, and see if she can read them and understand what she's reading. So I do work with her. She also has a reading program that she does not every day like she's supposed to. She uses the weekends to catch up. Anyways, um, I'm going to get started. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Mm. Yes, no, maybe so. Mwah. Okay. Probably not a day goes by that we don't see or ride in a car. 
we see a car every day, don't we? Yeah. And there are days that we sometimes ride in a car, right? So it does make sense. Okay, let's let's continue. Which makes it hard to believe that it's only been just a bit more than a hundred years since the first car trip across the United States. In 1903, a young man named Horatio Jackson, sorry, Horatio Jackson, accepted a bet that an automobile could not be driven from California to New York in less than three months. During a time when most people traveled in carriages pulled by horses. Okay. All right. Anyways, um, this is an adventurous undertaking. There were no gas stations, no road atlases, and only 155 or er, 150 miles of paved road in the whole entire country. Mm. There's probably about that much in our own city right now. <laughs> well, if you count Tri-Cities, um, all the cities in Tri-Cities, there's Pasco, Kennewick, Richland, all of that road in between them and in the cities themselves. Anyways, um, the car's highest speed was 30 miles an hour, but most of the time it was driven much slower than this. Parts of the car fell off during the rough ride. And it had no top, nothing overhead, and no windshield. Jackson hired Seawall K. Crocker to be his mechanic and to help with the driving. Along the way, a stranger gave a young bulldog named Bud to Jackson. The two men wore goggles to keep the dust out of their eyes, and so did Bud. Mm -hmm. Jackson removed the car's back seat to allow more room for supplies, including sleeping bags, cooking utensils, warm clothes, and tools. Many nights, he and Crocker camped out because they were in rural, rural areas far from a town. They faced a variety of annoyances. They got stuck in sand and mud several times and had to pull or dig the car out. They drove back and forth zigzagging to find a way to cross gullies that had no bridges. When they had to cross a river, they endured a bouncy trip along a ra railroad trestle. They had to replace wheels and other parts over and over again. In addition, they caused a lot of excitement as they traveled. Sometimes people gave the men directions that took them out of their way. The people did this so that their relatives could have a chance to see an automobile for the first time. Mm. Tricky, tricky. Although there were no gas stations, general stores in most towns had fuel. The men and their mud-covered machine caused quite a sensation when they pulled into a new community. The Telegraph announced Jackson's approach to each town. As the news of the adventure spread, two automobile companies sent out drivers to try to pass Jackson and to get to New York first. However, Jackson was confident that he would beat them, and he did. Jackson, Crocker, and Bud traveled 5,600 miles in 63 days, helping to establish the automobile as a new reliable mode of transportation. Jackson never did collect the original wager. Success must have been a sweeter reward. Yeah, he never collected the on the original wager. Probably, you know, at that time, even Houdini got gypped um, out of wagers because people put wagers up thinking that they were going to win, and they didn't, so they never paid up. Mm. Yeah, Houdini himself at that time got gypped. Um, it, it happened, oh gosh, I don't know how many times. One guy ended up putting up um, his, like half of half of the deed of um, a theater, you know, where they did performances like um, what Houdini did or operas or, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. stage plays. Yeah, one guy ended up owing Houdini and, 
gave half of his deed to it to pay him off. So, yeah, there's there's times where, you know, stuff like that happens. Anyways, back to the lesson, okay? What is the author's main purpose for writing the passage? To tell the story of the first cross-country car trip? To entertain with details about difficulties of traveling? To explain the ways in which cars have changed over the years? Or to convince readers to of the fun of driving very long distance? Yeah, not the last one. Not the last one? Okay, um... Well, what about, let's go back through it again. To tell the story of the first cross-country car trip. Oh, you said the last one? Convince readers of the fun of driving very long distances? Yes. Okay. In which of the following is the most likely reason there were only 150 miles of paved roads in 1903? Drivers only used their cars in and around cities. Cars were new and not yet widely used. Very few people knew how to pave roads. Or many towns did not have the funds to build roads. Mm. Well, why didn't they have so many paved roads? You know, like streets that we have. Those are paved. Okay, why do you think? Is it because the drivers use their cars in and around cities only? Or cars were new and not yet widely used? Yeah. That one? Okay. Why did Jackson and Crocker need to replace so many wheels and parts? They were careless drivers. Um, their car was old. The rough driving surfaces damaged the car, or the car was made with poor quality materials. Poor quality materials. Do we know? Cause did it say that in the in the text? No. Okay. Um. What do we know from the text? Were they careless drivers? Yeah. Are you sure? We know the car wasn't old, right? What about? The rough driving surfaces damaged the car. Probably that. You think that? Or is it they were careless drivers? I think you were joking about that. I was. I knew it. Okay. What was one result of driving an unpaved road with no windshield? It allowed Crocker and Jackson to go faster. The passengers and supplies fell out of the car. <laughs> People along the way could see them easily. Or a lot of dust got in the car and on the passengers. There was no oh, there, yeah, there was. The driver and the mechanic he took, plus the dog that they picked up. Oh, did they have a dog? Dork. They had a dog? Yes. Oh, okay, let me go back to the... Okay, it says, do, 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 do. along the way, a stranger gave a young bulldog named Bud to Jackson. Mm -hmm. The two men wore goggles to keep dust out of their eyes, and so did Bud. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Why wasn't there a husky? Well, because huskies are primarily northern part of North America. And other countries, I think, too. But, um, yeah. Huskies are more better. Huskies are adorable, yes. Okay. Can we get back to the question? Okay. Okay. What was one result of driving in unpaved roads with no windshields? It allowed them to go faster. The passengers and supplies fell out of the car. People along the way could see them easy, or a lot of dust got in the car and on the passengers. Dust? Dust? Uh, okay. Then let's go with it. Jackson hired Seawall K. Crocker to be his mechanic and to help him with the driving. 
Which of the following could be used to check this statement as fact? A map of New York City. <laughs> um, this fact right here, Jackson hired Seawall K. Crocker to be his mechanic and help him with the driving. Does a map of New York City help you find out if that's true or not? No. Okay. How about a dictionary? No. Um, how about a newspaper of that time, 1903? Oh, it's not for me. Or thesaurus. What's a thesaurus? Thesaurus. Uh, okay. You, you forgot. I, I've told you many times what a thesaurus is. All right. So it's a it's a it's kind of like the dictionary, but it gives you other words that are similar to the same meaning as the word you're looking up. So if you want to say look up a different word for um mm, blue. Purple. It would have different words that um oh, yeah. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe better word would be like, um, hurt. You can look up hurt in the thesaurus and you can find out different words Ooh. that have the same meaning as hurt. Ooh. Okay. Hurt is not the same meaning as wolves. You're not going to find wolves in a thesaurus next to hurt. <laughs> Goofa. All right. Why did two car companies get to try the New York, or get to the New York before, wait, let me start this over. I'm tongue-tied right now. Why did two car companies try to get to New York before Jackson? It'd be good for business, as their cars were in the news. Um, they did not like Jackson, so they wanted to beat him. The, it would make it easier for them to repair Jackson's car, or they wanted to min, win the money for the bet. Win the money for the bet. You think? Oh. Uh, the section ends, Jackson never did collect in the original wager. Success must have been sweeter than reward. What does this suggest about him? He was too angry to collect. He was satisfied with what he had done. He was an extremely forgetful man, or he was too ashamed to take the money. Oh. And this is a might be. What might be the reason why he didn't collect the money? Oh. Was he too angry? No. Okay. Uh, was he an extremely forgetful man? I think so. Yeah, but if he was that extremely forgetful, then don't you think halfway across the United States he'd forget what he was doing? <laughs> what about, was he too ashamed to take the money? No. Or he was satisfied with what he had done? Yep. Okay. That one sounds like the best one then? The, all right, let's go to the next one. The title of the selection is called Cross Country by Car. Which of the following would be best as another title? Travels with Bud. Sleeping Under the Stars. American Travels. Or Road Trip. American Head Travels. <laughs> it's like... Mm -hmm. <laughs> what if, What about road trip? Does that sound right? No. Really? No, because they don't have much paved roads back then, huh? No, no, no. Come here. Come here. Mm, that must be your hair dye. Okay. Um, travels with Bud, Sleeping Under the Stars, American Travels. American Travels. You want to go with that? Because they didn't have very many paved roads, but what about regular roads that weren't paved? Wooded roads. No, I was saying in gravel, dirt. Mm. They had a lot of dirt and gravel roads back then. Mm. So it could be road trip. 
No. No? Okay. This passage is an example of what? An autobiography, a narrative nonfiction, historical fiction, or a journal entry? A journal entry? Well, let's look at that. A journal entry is what? Maybe not. It's what somebody writes about themselves, right? With, with their feelings and things they went through, right? Yeah. Okay, so did it sound like a journal entry? No. Okay, how about, um, let's go with narrative nonfiction. Nonfiction means that, what, what does fiction mean? Uh, sci-fi fiction. Okay, sci-fi is an example. Also, fairy tales and stuff like that. Those are all, what, fiction or nonfiction? Fiction. Okay, so a nonfiction would be what? Normal person's life. So real, right? So now let's look at your options. You have a narrative nonfiction or a historical fiction. Nonfiction. Okay. Look at this map, okay. What is the most likely reason this route was chosen? Okay, so there's the map right there. I think. Well, that's in Antarctica, what? What map is it talking about? Oh, this map. Okay. Derp, 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 derp. Okay. You should put that map down there. Yeah. And they should have put it next to the question so that I was knew what it was talking about. So it's talking about this map here. It wants to know why that was the likely route. It was near railroad tracks, which mean it could get supplies. The men didn't have to worry about crossing any mountains. It was just shortest distance from east to west. Or it included the most beautiful parts of the country. They're in a race of time, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's rule some of these out. Um, did they get all of their supplies from railroad? No. Okay, so they didn't always travel near railroad tracks where they could get supplies, right? Mm -hmm. What about the men did not have to worry about crossing any mountains? Let's look at the map again. Would you say that there were mountains where they went? Probably. Yeah, it doesn't really show, and it didn't say anything about that, did it? What about it was the shortest distance between east and west coasts? No. Are you sure? Shortest distance race. What would you do in a race? Go to the, go to the airport. Take as many shortcuts as possible. Mm -hmm. And take the fastest route. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you would want the shortest distance between east and west? Mm -hmm. Okay. I know, I kind of led you on that one. Mm -mm. I'm a bad mom. I led you to the answer. Nope. Yep. No. Nope. Okay. All right, so you know what I want to do? I want to take a pause right now. I want you to go eat, drink, whatever. This is a really long test. So go take a take a break. Yeah. I love you, Mom. I love you, too. And I'm trying to figure out how to pause this thing. Oh, there's the pause. And we're back. Okay, so I realized earlier I said several of his uncles. I'm thinking I need to elaborate on that a little bit. She has nine uncles. So there's ten in total if you count her dad. 
um, no girls, just boys. Basically a football team. <laughs> Anyways, um, and most of them do struggle. Um, most of them either can't read or struggle really, really, really hard. There's only, I think, two that do well enough that it's not too much of a struggle, but most of them have this struggle. My oldest daughter, her sister, has a little bit of struggle, but not as bad. She's pretty good at reading. So um, I was able to work with her, which also frustrates me because um, I was able to work with her and get her better at reading, but I'm still struggling with hope to get better. Anyways, let's get back to your lesson, okay? Are you ready? You're going to eat popcorn. All right. Anne Bancroft and Liv Arn Arneson. Okay. I thought I said Armstrong. Well, I thought I was going to say that too, but it's, it's actually Arneson. Grew up thousands of miles apart, yet they shared a childhood dream. They each wanted to cross the frozen continent of Antarctica. As adults, they accomplished a number of feats. Bancroft climbed Mount McKinley, the highest peak in North America, which has been renamed to its original name. I'm trying to remember that right now, but let me see if I can find out its original name. Denali. Okay, now, here's the thing about Mount McKinley and why it was changed to Denali. Um, I don't want to get it wrong, so I'm going to go back to the research I found. Last year, it was brought up because... Um, the president decided it should be named what it was originally named. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I like that mountain. Yeah, it's it pretty, like, isn't it? It looks like Alaska's mountain. It is a lot. Um, I think it is. Alaska's Mountain. Hold on. Yes. Let's see here. Okay, so Denali was the original, you know, people of Alaskans name for the mountain. Mm -hmm. But a prospector who was mining in that mountain named it to McKinley after the president, William McKinley, who was president at the time. Okay, last year, um, President Obama um, said that we need to give it its original name. We need to, you know, give it back its name. Okay. Um, there is some dispute about that still, oddly enough. But um, I was just reading here that, um, somewhere here that um, Trump said something about it. So let me see if I can find anything here about it. Wikipedia is not exactly, you know, a perfect site to find information on. People can edit it if you notice there's an edit button here. But they're getting a little bit more pickier about how people can edit it now. You have to offer credentials and, and other things in order to get things edited. But still, people don't trust Wikipedia. But it does coincide with what um, I had learned about Denali last year when I heard media drama about the, the mountain itself. 
Now, I don't... Mm, trying to find something where it's talking about Trump. But it's not... Um, it's not really needed. Because you don't need to know what Trump is saying or not saying. It seems like a lot of people think they know what Trump's saying and speculate a lot, but I'm not going to get into politics. That's just ridiculous. Anyways, um, so Mount McKinley was actually originally named Denali. Okay. Bancroft climbed Mount McKinley, the highest peak in North America. She was the first woman to ski a Overland across Greenland. She traveled to North Pole by dog sled and she led a team of women to South Pole. Arneson attempted to climb Mount Everest, the highest mountain on Earth. Actually, that's not true either. What is up with this um, improper information? The star. Yeah, I see that. I, I, okay, look, Mount Everest isn't really the tallest mountain on Earth. Okay, that's just one, and there's a whole bunch of others are also saying that as well. So, again, information isn't always accurate. So, you got to know what's going on in the world to understand that not all information you're given is true. Mm -hmm. uh, know that. Okay. So anyways, at that time, they, they, the person, the time the person wrote this, that's what she was told, what she believed or he, whoever wrote this. Okay. So understand that as well. Um, she was the first woman to ski to the South Pole alone and with no outside support. Following this event, Bancroft contacted Arneson and the two began working together to realize their childhood dream. Because they were traveling to such a difficult and faraway place, they had to be tough and independent. They learned how to sew up wounds and what to do in the event of a life-threatening injury. Bancroft spent some time in an ice cream freezer where she tested her gear and tried to adapt to icy temperatures. They knew that they would face winds up to 100 miles per hour and indeed they intended to use these winds to progress. The women would use wind sails when the conditions were right to help propel them toward their goal. Bancroft and Arneson only had a 100-day window of opportunity. Why do you think they had a 100-day window? Uh, they wanted to explore, what was it again? Antarctica, right? Mm -hmm. So why did they have a 100-day window? Don't know. Don't know? Well, I, I'll tell you one thing I do know about um, Antarctica is most of the time it's covered in complete darkness. There's only like a couple months where there's sun. The rest of the time it's complete darkness. So um, when it's in complete darkness, do you think the weather will be warmer or colder? Colder? Right. So it would be more dangerous, right? So they wanted to go when, you know, it was less dangerous. Okay. Let's see here. Weather conditions for such a trip are uncomfortable year round. But beyond this time, it would be too cold for an airplane to fly in and pick them up at the journey's end. Each woman pulled a 250-pound sled loaded with gear and food. Although Antarctica is the windiest place on Earth, 
The adventurers endured many windless days. This meant they were traveling slower than they had planned. There were days when they only traveled a mile each hour. As a result, they had to ration their food. Still, after 93 days, they became the first women to cross Antarctica on skis. Their final job was to build the runway where the plane coming to pick them up would land. They set out with the goal to cross Antarctica and to see what difficulties people can overcome to make their dreams come true. And they succeeded. Yeah, they gave themselves, what, three days to, to build the... I know, seven days. Sorry, seven days to build the runway, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's enough time to build a runway for a plane. It was just, you know, one small plane, passenger plane. Okay, now we have to look at the map. What mountains did Bancroft and Arneson cross? So if you look at the map, uh, the map here, there's a name right there, right? And they look like mountains? Yeah? Okay, so try to remember the letters of the names. Okay. Now, let's see if you can pick out the answer. Top one? Is it the top one? Let's take a look at the map again. It's pretty big though. Okay, well, maybe you should get closer then. Okay, so these are the mountains, right, that they cross because if you look at the line, it crosses... Oh, I see it. Oh, you see it now? All right, so what is the answer? Middle top. Middle top. That one. Okay. Bancroft and Arneson originally planned to travel from Queen Maud Land to McMurdo Station. They stopped before crossing the Ross Ice Shelf because bad weather. Look at the map. Which of the following describes part of the trip they did not complete? Okay, so they were to go from Queen Maudlin to McMurdo Station. Okay, so Queen Laud Maudlin is this here, right? And McMurdo Station <coughs> is here. Okay. The rest of the question says they stopped before crossing the Ross Ice Shelf because of bad weather. So, what's that say? Oh, okay, there's the Ross Eye Shelf right here. This, um, yeah, wait. I know. I see. Okay. You zoomed in too much. What part of the trip did they not complete? Okay. It says that they stopped before the Ross Ice Shelf, right? Yeah. Okay. Was it the shortest leg of the journey? The longest leg of the journey? They would have had to cross water to get there, or they needed to cross the Antarctic Peninsula to get there. This is the peninsula right here. So, can we rule out the first or the last one? Yeah. Okay, so if they stopped before the shelf, ice shelf, what would be true about that? It was the longest part of the journey. Journey, the shortest part. Longest. Well, let's see. Look. Okay, see this black line down the middle. Mm -hmm. That is the, the whole trip right there. Well, what they were supposed to do. Okay, and they ended up stopping about right there. Mm -hmm. So is it the longest or the shortest? Sure. It's the shortest? Okay. What is the first paragraph mostly about? The achievements of each woman? Women? Yeah. 
Yeah. Or how Bancroft and Arnson met, how the or uh, where the women wanted to travel, what inspired the women's childhood dreams. So, um, as for when they met, that wasn't, hold on, that was at the end of the paragraph. It says, following this event, Bancroft contacted Arneson and the two began working together. That was the last sentence. Okay, but that wasn't the whole paragraph, right? So, I think you're right. I think it was about their accomplishment. The author starts to the selection by saying that the women grew up thousands of miles apart. Why does the author begin this way? To surprise the reader with their meeting, to explain where each woman came from, to show the reader that some meetings are planned, or to emphasize the similarities and differences? Similarities and differences? Okay. What did Bancroft and Arneson have in common? They both enjoyed traveling with sled dogs. They both climbed Mount Everest. Mount Everest. Mount Everest. Um, they both liked cold weather adventure, or they both preferred doing things alone. Did they both climb Mount Everest? Yes. Did they? Let me see here. Okay. Anderson attempted to climb Mount Everest, the highest mountain on earth. She was the first woman to ski. Um, the other one climbed the other mountain. Okay. Mount, okay. Mount McKinley. Okay. Um, so it's not Mount Everest. What about the other ones? Because we're going to do process of elimination to find the right answer. Mm -hmm. They both like cold weather adventure. They both prefer doing things alone. Or they enjoy traveling with sled dogs. Do you step alone? Uh, let's see here. As adults, they accomplished a number of feats. Bancroft climbed Mount McKinley, the highest peak in North America. She was the first woman to ski across Greenland. She traveled to North Pole by dog sled, and she led a team of women to South Pole. Does that sound like she works alone? Dog sled. Okay, let's see here. She did. They do like to ski. Look, it says uh, she was the first woman to ski over land across Greenland. Right? Um, and then the other one, it says, um, Arneson attempted to climb Mount Everest. She was the first woman to ski to South Pole with no outside support. Following this event, they began working together. So they both were skiing, but um, I don't see anything about dog sled, though. They knew how to sew up wounds um, and what to do in a life threatening emergency, right? Mm -hmm. So, let's see here. Yeah, Here's a cup. Mm. Um, we can't say it's dog sleds because only one of them said something about dog sleds. We have to go with what we know. Right? This has it has a little bit of pop in it. It looks okay. And we know that they both did not climb Mount Everest. Mm -hmm. So there's only two options left. They both like cold wa uh, weather adventure or they prefer doing things alone. Cool. The cold never buy me anyway. <laughs> what caused the women to ration their food? The days without wind slowed them down. They wanted to split the food equally. Oh, the wind. The, the wind. wind. The wind. The wind. The wind. The wind. The wind. Okay. 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 Yeah. How did the women properly feel at the end of the journey? Relieved and upset, confused and lost, exhausted and proud, 
Scared and nervous. Scared? Were they? I don't think. You don't think so? What about exhausted and proud? Yeah, probably. They did travel for 93 days. And they made it to the end, right? Mm -hmm. What was the last thing the women did before leaving Antarctica? They went wind sailing. They learned how to stitch. Wait, before leaving Antarctica? They learned how to stitch injuries? No. I would think they would want to do that before even going to Antarctica, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, they tested their cold weather gear. Or they built a runway for the airplane. Runway. Yeah, they tested the cold weather gear before going too, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. What is the author's main purpose for writing this selection? To convince people, readers to become adventurers? To express feelings about Bancroft and Arneson's journey? Did they actually give opinion? No. So they didn't give feelings, right? Um, explain weather conditions for the South Pole or inform readers about the first women to cross Antarctica. Weather conditions. Weather conditions for the South Pole? Mm -hmm. I would think because it was mostly about the women, right? It would be about their journey. Yeah, so it would be about the weather conditions. Well, it did say some about the weather conditions, but it did did it describe like in detail what all the weather conditions were that they had to endure. 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 Yes, that they had to go through. That's what endure means. The weather that they had to go through. Did it explain in detail what what the different types of weather that they had to go through? But did it give detail about their travel? Yes. So would you say that it would be a better choice to pick, to inform the readers about the first woman to cross? Mm -hmm. Another clue would be that it talked about what the women did before, right? Mm -hmm. It didn't talk anything much about the weather before. So, yeah, that's another clue as to what it's talking about. <sighs> okay. Now you have some vocab words. You need to um, follow the question, uh, following the question, find the correct answer. Okay. Making dreams come true. Tells of an uncomfortable trip across Antarctica. In other words, the trip was what? Not comfortable, very comfortable, most comfortable, or almost comfortable. Almost. It tells of an uncomfortable trip. Mm. So, are you saying that an uncomfortable trip is almost comfortable? Yeah. No? Okay. Then what could it be? Um, most comfortable, very comfortable, or not comfortable? Not comfortable. Okay. Bancroft and Arneson were described as tough and independent. Okay. What does the prefix in mean in independent? Not, less, more, or very. Very. What does intended mean in this sentence, making dreams come true? They intended to use the winds to progress. They leaned, remembered, attempted, or planned? Planned. We're getting close to the end. What does endured mean? I use that word. Huh? Endured mean in this sentence, making dreams come true. The the adventurers endured many windless days. 
they thrived on, sailed in, lived through, or hoped for. The adventures hoped for many windless days. No. Okay, the adventures thrived on, sailed in, or lived through. Lived through? Lived through. The adventures lived through many windless days. Does that sound correct? Uh-huh. Okay. What does the prefix re mean in the word replace? Replace. Under, within, above, or again? Again. Which of the following best explains the phrase, nothing overhead? The car had no windows. The car was not in a garage. The car had no roof. The car was completely paid for. The car was completely paid for. Nothing overhead. Oh. It could get rained on. <coughs> and why? Because they had no windows, it wasn't in a garage, or they had no roof? No roof. Okay. Cross Country by Car states, Jackson never did collect on the original wager that had been made. Which of these is a synonym for wager? Salary, race, exchange, or bet? Bet. Which of the meaning of sensation is used by in Cross Country by Car? In the following sentence, the men and their mud-covered machine caused a sensation when they pulled into each new community. A feeling, a crowd, a thrill, or success. Yes. Each men and their mud-covered machine caused a success when they pulled into each new community. No. Okay, uh, let's try a different word. The men and their mud-covered machine caused a crowd when they pulled into each new community. Yeah, that's probably two. Okay, so remember, you've got to use a process of elimination. If one thing doesn't fit in its place, then you got to get rid of it and find something that does fit. Okay? Thank you. And sometimes, like with those stories, we have to go back and reread just to make sure that we know. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Which of the following best describes the telegraph that announced the car's arrival in each town across country by car? A newspaper with a local and national news? A radio network with many stations? A system that sent news in great distances? Or a system for sending codes underground? Underground? Probably not. I'm trying to think of what telegraphs were. I think they were wires that were like strung. Kind of like those out there. But I could be wrong. Telegraph. Telegraph. Um, could it be, is it a radio network? It probably is. A newspaper or a system that sent news in great distances. Do you think they had radios back then? Probably or probably not. You never know. Well, telegraphs. Telegraphs. That was like one of the first forms of communication after the Pony Express, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, if the Pony Express were actual ponies delivering news from one town to another, and the telegraph was the next thing, what is a telegraph? Do you know what a telegraph is? Uh, I forgot the well, okay. It was a machine that they had in, like, um, the post, excuse me, the post office area most of the time, where the Pony Express would bring mail. And there would be these machines that would give you messages by Morse code. 
You know that, right? I don't know what I just said. I hope I didn't cuss. <laughs> um, but, okay, so it was a system that made a bunch of beeps and, and noise, right? Mm -hmm. And then the person at the office would decipher those into actual words to make messages, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so sit up. Now, could it be a newspaper, a radio, a system that sent news in great distances? Yeah, the last one you said. Okay, or it could be a system for sending codes underground. Why would it be sending codes underground, though? <laughs> That's the question. Why? Sometimes you just got to ask why. And, and, and think to yourself, does that even make sense? No. Okay. What is meant by the ter term mechanic in cross-country by car? A machine, a machine tool, part of a machine, or a machine worker? A machine worker. No, oh, just machine tool. Well, it kind of is a tool, isn't he? He has to do... You know, work with the tools, but in a sense, he is a tool too, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So the following questions um, each have a word that you have to figure out if it if it's um, a type of grammar. Okay, so here here's an ex here's one the first one. The boy spoke calmly. Is that a noun? A verb, an adverb, or an adjective? Adjective. It is a simple problem. Is simple a noun, verb, adverb, or adjective? Adverb. The teacher is very patient. Patient is the word. Adjective, verb, pronoun, or noun? Noun. My brother will be here soon. Soon is the word. Is it noun, verb, adverb, or pronoun? Pronoun. Which sentence is written correctly? Her room is neater than his. <clears throat> she is the faster runner in the class. He is most careful than her. That pillow is soft than this one. Probably. That pillow is soft than this one. That pillow is softer than this one. You said softer. That's not what that says, though. Oh! Ah. Uh, see, you know how to do it. You just weren't listening to all the sounds. So, would you say that the, it's the first one, then? Mm -hmm. Okay. Which sentence is yeah. written correctly? Our team is gooder than your team. We have the most funniest teacher in the school. Okay. My brother is youngest than her brother. Mm -mm. That is the dirtiest dog I've ever seen. The way he he he's so dirtiest. What about it? Pray again and listen. That is the dirtiest dog I've ever seen. Are you saying it's correct or? Incorrect. Choose it. Oh, you're choosing it? Okay. Which sentence is written correctly? Her brother is strongest than she is. No. She is the best singer in the group. Oh, probably that one. That is the most happiest day in my life. No. My sister is more older than I am. No. 
So she is the best singer in the group. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one more. Which sentence is written correctly? This is the longer paper I have written. No. Rob is a slower runner than Tom. Rob, Tom. These socks are more drier than those. No. The old horse is more big than the young horse. I think Rob and Tom. Rob. I, I'm Rob. I, I'm Tom. It's like, hi, I'm Timmy. Hi, I'm Timmy. Hi, I'm Tom. You've got ten questions wrong, it looks like. Uh, yep. There's only ten. You got 73%. There's only ten. Okay. Do you want to try to give another answer? Or no? Uh, it's for Bacallis. Okay. If you should decide, um, what I'll do is I'll go back through here, look at what answers you got wrong, and actually, can I do that? I better make screenies before, before, um, yeah, before I close this out. That way I can see what answers you got wrong, what the possible answers are, and then if you want to fix it later, you can. Yeah. Because this is one of the bigger tests. It gives you uh, most of your grade point average. Yeah. Okay. All right. So anyways, this is how we do. I led her a couple of times, yes, or made her think about what the possible answers are. But as you can see, I don't actually give her the answers. I don't actually say that's the wrong answer. This is the answer. So now you know that... Yeah, my teacher's insecurities are unfounded. Gobble. Turkey. You just gobbled. You just gobbled, you turkey. All right, anyways. See you next time.